The Coin Week podcast is brought to you by Certified Acceptance Corporation, CAC. When I first started buying certified coins, I thought, as long as the grade on the holder said something, then that's what the coin was. But as I researched coin values at auctions and checked with other collectors and dealers, I quickly learned that quality coins outperform all others. Even coins that are correctly graded can fail the I want it test when put in front of a serious collector. That is why John Albanese founded CAC, and that is why CAC coins trade for higher premiums than coins without the green bean. It's true. Your coin collection is a serious investment. Protect it and yourself by choosing coins that have two degrees of expert opinion. This week on the Coin Week podcast, I am joined by Red Book editor emeritus Ken Brissett. Since the 1970s, Ken has helmed the most important book in the coin collecting hobby. His writing and research and market knowledge has benefited generations of collectors, and he has had an immeasurable impact on the growth of the coin hobby through his well-researched work and reasoned opinions. Our conversation is next on the Coin Week Podcast. Hi, Ken. Hi, Charles. Happy to be here. You've had a long and storied career as a numismatic author and researcher, market analyst, and a long-term relationship as editor of one of the most important books in the coin collecting hobby, The Red Book. Uh, having taken over the reins after uh, Dick Yeo, known to most uh, collectors as R.S. Yeoman, uh, retired in 1970. So it is an honor to have you on uh, to talk about the hobby and gain some of your insights uh, as somebody who's been involved in collecting coins since 1937 and uh, someone who has a lifetime of experience in the rare coin market. I think today's collectors would gain tremendously if you would be able to impart a few of the things that you've learned over the years and to discuss where the hobby's been and how it ended up where it is today. Well, I'm happy to be here and uh, I'll try to share some things with you. Uh, I guess I have had a, a long a long uh, string of experiences in the hobby, and I've enjoyed every minute of it. So if I could pass any of that uh, enthusiasm or help along to collectors, uh, I'll, feel, I'll feel I've done a good day's work today. Well, I first became familiar with your early work uh, some years ago when I discovered the wonderful but short-lived periodical The Whitman Numismatic Journal, uh, which was published from 1964 to 1968. This was some of your first work with Whitman, is that correct? Yes, that is correct. Um, that, I, that was a great experience. I really enjoyed that. Um, it was uh, Dick Yeoman's idea to, uh, to produce that uh, periodical, and um, it was just a lot of fun. At that time, there were a limited number of, of good writers around, and very few publications, and uh, we just thought it would be fun to bring everybody together and and uh, to try to produce something like that. Uh, about the only thing on the market at that time was the uh, numismatic scrapbook magazine and, of course, the numismatist. And um, so we felt somewhere in between those. Um, I just tried to present some original articles and, uh, and a few... Um, classic articles that we reproduced, and um, I think uh, there was a, a lot of good information in there that's somehow missed by most people today. The, the publication has been superseded by so many other fine things that uh, it's kind of been lost in antiquity, but still, every once in a while, I have to dig back into my uh, my set of, uh, of the journals and uh, find some article that's still pertinent today. I'll tell you one thing, Ken, as someone who publishes a daily numismatic publication uh, with Coin Week, I draw from the past an enormous wealth of knowledge and insights from publications that came before. Some are well known today, you know, still, yet uh, others might be considered obscure for whatever reason. But for me, there is a special place literally on my shelf. <laughs> there are hardbound volumes. Uh, for the Whitman Numismatic Journal. At the time it was being published, it was essentially peerless. 
Uh, and though I love the numismatic scrapbook, which uh, I also collect, the uh, WNJ is a perfect blend of coin popularization and really well done deep digging into numismatic topics. I strongly believe your work here truly stands the test of time. Well, well thank you. That's, those are nice words. Um, I'll tell you a secret. Um, we had a very small staff. Um, there was Neil Schaefer and myself primarily, and um, we called upon uh, good writers at that time. But uh, <laughs> for many, many times, we had um, pen names that we used, and we wrote a lot of the articles, uh, Neil Schaefer and myself, um, and Larry Block. Um, we wrote a, l a good number of the articles under different names. <laughs> Well, if I'm not mistaken, I, I believe that Block uh, left Whitman around 1966 and got out of the numismatic scene. Well, he, he's become world famous, of course, as a, a, a writer of uh, mystery stories. Yeah, but it was fun working with him. He was a real character. The coin market after World War II, which is when uh, the Red Book got its start, uh, as it was sort of an update to the uh, price guide that uh, Wait Raymond had been putting out for years. Uh, yes, yes. So in 1947, the first Red Book comes out and provides a template for the broadening of the coin collecting hobby. If you were to go back before World War II and maybe even before the commemorative coin boom of the 1930s, the hobby was still relatively small. You know, the major coin clubs and institutions like the ANA were fairly close-knit communities of collectors. Uh, you know, many of these people knew each other by name. Uh, they bought each other's collections at auctions. Uh, and when the ANA had a convention back then, you know, people would bring their wives, and it would be a much different experience than we have now. This past part of the hobby was, you know, ANA conventions as black tie affairs, and where you go meet the mayor and get the key to the city, and you go tour the municipal center with your wives in the afternoon at a picnic. I mean, all the benefits of being a member of high society and good standing came with being a member of the ANA. Not like today, where it's concrete floors and aisles lined with dealer cases and kids filling out passport books and random comers and goers. This was a world that probably was more like the ANS gala than what we think about the ANA today. But when you get to the Red Book uh, after World War II, there's just so much information there. And it's there immediately for you. It does not judge you and reveal its secrets only to the informed and the already initiated. And in my opinion, it's the most effective vehicle for delivering specialist knowledge that the hobby has ever produced. And I don't see the coin boom of the 50s and 60s happening without the Red Book being front and center. Um, that's probably true. Uh, that and the coin folders that, um, that got people started... Uh, Take, taking coins out of circulation and putting them in their folders, um, just as a almost like a game or uh, you know some some activity that uh, was kind of new. And um, when people began to discover that uh, some of those coins actually had added value, um, um, I, that's sort of when the hobby blossomed. Uh, it was after the war, and people were. Um, you know, at that time, a little more relaxed and feeling feeling good about themselves and maybe having a little extra money in their pocket. And and so they began collecting coins yeah, kind of seriously, uh, although not not with the uh, with the vigor that we see today with people uh, dabbling in thousands of dollars worth of coins. And it was a, a fun hobby back then today, I think, has become very, very commercial, and uh, the emphasis a lot is on um, you know, superb quality or uh, great rarity or great price. Uh, and people, are, in my estimation, are overlooking the thought that there is just a lot of fun and, and um, enjoyment in finding older coins that are uh, different and and very collectible. In this period, how difficult was it for you or the Red Book staff to ascertain what the value of a coin was? You know, I think we take for granted the massive amount of information that we have access to today, you know, at the click of a mouse. But 
But back in the 50s and 60s, you had to rely much more on reports from the field. And with the coin market seeing such a massive influx of new collectors, it seems to me, and judging by all the Red Book data I have seen from the period, prices were not set in place for too long. It was volatile market for some coins. Others really took off and didn't look back for years. And I think a large part of the appeal for coins as we entered into the rare coin investment period of the 70s and 80s was the fact that in the preceding decades, we saw an upward climb for most rare coins. And I think this also fed into the popularity of each subsequent edition as collectors wanted to see what their gains were from year to year. Well, um, that occurred in the, in the 1960s and 70s when there was a really uh, a big boom in collecting and prices were indeed very volatile then. Uh, but in earlier times, uh, you know, from in the in the uh, oh late late 40s, even into the 50s, it was just a steady progression of pricing. But um, there were fewer dealers, and the dealers were quite um, oh, well known to each other and to us, and we took on a core of people that we felt were trustworthy and heavily involved in the market, and um, those were, you know, always listed in the front of the Red Book as uh, our contributors, and we carefully um, analyzed all the price suggestions or um, comments that they made and uh, came up with the average average prices. It was a time-consuming job because we didn't have computers or the kind of uh, analytical equipment that you have today, but uh, but it was a task that we uh, that we did and did as well as we could. And during the period before third-party grading was introduced to the hobby in the mid-1980s, many coins that traded at retail coin shops across the country actually hewed quite closely to the prices that were published in the Red Book. It was only when we saw the divergence in what I would call coin collectors and coin investors that we saw prices for conditional rarities dramatically depart from the prices that one would find in the Red Book. Quite right. Good observation. Yes, I'm afraid today um, grading and pricing um, have somehow been blended together, and it, it seems like yeah, rather than establishing a, 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 a particular grade of a coin, they people seem to evaluate it first and then assign a grade that goes along with the price. Now, that is very confusing, confusing to me, certainly, and to many people, but it is a fact of life today. Well, certainly these superb gem quality coins were not made after 1986. They, they always existed. And before the ANA adopted the ANA grading standards of MS-63 and MS-65, coins that exhibited no signs of wear were simply listed as being uncirculated. And yes, I think it's clear that Collectors then paid premium prices for the best coins. You know, that fact is always true. But the degree in which these premiums were paid is much more significant now than it was, say, at the height of the coin boom in the 1960s. That's correct. Uh, they were usually had an adjective with them as superb or something like that. And um, collectors kind of knew that there were a couple levels of uncirculatedness, if we can use that word. Um, uh, uh, you know, a normal uncirculated coin would have one value, and uh, then if it had, uh, if the dealer um, said that it was a superb strike or something of that nature, uh, well, we kind of knew it was a premium coin and brought a premium price. Um, but uh, it wasn't until uh, well, let me say this: the the value wasn't terribly different between uh, different between a normal uncirculated and a, and what they would call then maybe a gem or a superb piece. Uh, it was when the values escalated the way they have in recent times. So there's a tremendous, tremendous difference between say a 62 and a 68 today. You had to then find some intermediate levels that you could somehow describe 
to uh, to account for the difference in value. Uh, so it's been market driven. These, these uh, new grades that are used today are just market driven. Well, let me ask you about that because uh, you use the word market. I, I think it's important for people to understand on the one hand, yes, there's a viable market for certain types, classes and dates, but the size of that market is highly variable and some coins are highly illiquid. Uh, this wasn't necessarily the case a few decades ago when the hobby had a simpler accounting of coins in mint state. Our system today is built on the idea that one pays more for an MS-62 than an MS-61 and still more for an MS-63 and more for an MS-64 and on and on. Yes, in the past, collectors paid more for premium coins where there was a real competition for these coins. But in the marketplace, we weren't splitting hairs over fractional differences in quality. And because of this uh, escalating a cost of coins from one grade to the next, it seems that the present system has made coins so expensive that in many cases, the long-term value proposition for quality has been exposed as itself being vulnerable if the size of the market can no longer support the number of coins that exists in these high grades. Um, over the course of time that I've been involved, uh, you know, I've seen these various changes in attitude as to what collectors want to collect or should be collecting or are collecting. Um, there's, a, there's a kind of a herd instinct. Um, it used to be uh, uh, the collectible was Indian head cents. Um, that kind of changed and went moved towards Lincoln cents, the big, big uh, interest among a majority of collectors. Um, for a long run, it's been Morgan dollars. Um, and um, this is so interest in various fields keeps moving around and changing. Today, um, I think that um, there's, a, there's a whole new dynamics. Collectors um, in general, if we, if we can call a hobbyist, maybe, is a better term, uh, are, has a change in attitude. Uh, they're no longer interested in certain collectibles, um, be they um, movie mem memorabilia or uh, baseball cards or artwork or automobiles, whatever it is, there's a, there's a real dynamic change going on right now. Um, a generation of people have totally different interests today than they did even 10 years ago. And part of that is um, is affecting the um, numismatic interest or numismatic marketplace, whichever you want to call it. Um, and it's, uh, it's having an effect that we don't fully understand or appreciate at the moment. We're going to have to sort this thing out. I don't think interest in coin collecting is going to die. It'll change as it has over the years. But um, but we need to keep an eye on it. We need to, to learn uh, how we can spread the word that this is a very enjoyable pastime, uh, how we can invite new, new interests, new collectors into it. Um, and we need to pay very careful attention as to who these these new collectors um, are going to be. I'll put forward a theory. Uh, 1964 was a very important moment of our nation's coinage history, you know, where the American silver coinage was replaced by clad coinage. And this ended a tradition that began from the earliest years of the Mint. But this transition also occurred at an important cultural moment in time. For 1965 is the beginning of Generation X and the end of the baby boomer generation. So those born into Generation X never saw the circulation of silver coins, as most of these coins were completely extracted from circulation by 1969, you know, from what I've read. I mean, you experience it. I only read about it. We did get the bicentennial coin program. The half dollar and dollar didn't circulate, but the quarter did. Uh, and that, for me, and I think a lot of people in my age group, was a very special coin. Uh, I know, personally, it sparked my interest in coins. Of course, I couldn't get involved in the hobby in any real way without the help of people. And, and my person who helped me was my grandmother. She 
collected coins too, but you know, she never developed as a numismatist. She never went to coin shows or conventions. She was probably not a member of the ANA. She had a red book though. And she was likely drawn into the hobby when the silver was removed from coinage. Uh, and then afterwards, she bought GSA Morgan dollars and then later proof sets and then mint sets and commemoratives. The red book uh, to her was one of the things that you had to have if you were going to call yourself a coin collector. It was a way she kept track of the things that she bought. And so she bought me one as soon as I showed an interest in coins. And I think it was the 85 or the 86 red book, which was my first red book. And from there, I was hooked. From then on, I collected coins. I collected them throughout my childhood. I remember buying sacks of pennies off an ad in the back of Boys Life magazine. It might even have been from Little than Coins. I think, I think it probably was. But there is this prevailing attitude, I think, that exists by the baby boomer generation of dealers that coinage stopped in 1964. And that everything that came later is junk. You see a complete lack of interest in exploring this post-silver period from a numismatic perspective. You may see like an exploitation of it, but you don't see like a serious vested interest in the numismatic study of this period. And even as there is a built-in interest on the part of collectors of my generation for it, and seeing how much people buy coins as a physical memento of the past, the fact that in our marketplace, so little appreciation is given to coins that were struck during my lifetime. Uh, since my generation is the emerging generation of collectors that are now like replacing baby boomers, it's hard for me to imagine a scenario where the coin industry will be able to capture that sense of nostalgia in people who grew up like I did in the 70s and 80s. And it's not that we're not inherently interested in coins. I mean, we, we've collected and pulled out coins from change our entire lives. But when we're told that the coins that we've collected is junk and the only good coins were the coins that were saved or pulled from change 70 years or more ago, and I say this knowing full well of the coolness of like vintage coins, uh, you make this case and most people today will not relate to uh, the argument that coin collecting is, uh, is, is uh, interesting uh, or relevant to them as a modern pursuit. But if you look at the approach that the bicentennial quarter is cool and the Eisenhower dollar is cool, and if you remember seeing these coins in circulation or the uh, heraldic eagle uh, quarter before the spaghetti hair period, you know, was cool and uh, they're really uncommon in certain dates and ultra high uh, condition and uh, Jefferson Nichols and Lincoln Cents and all these things are cool. And they are a jumping off point to other series like the Franklin Half Dollar, the Mercury Dime, the Barber Coinage, and so on and so forth. Then I think once you have that respect built in for coins, you can see a continuum where collectors today can say, oh, I remember 20 years ago, the state quarter came out and wasn't that interesting. I remember putting a collection of those together. I wonder what it would be like to do that again. I don't remember what I did with them. Are they valuable? I think these are the kinds of questions that would spur Generation X collectors into the coin hobby. And once you have them, then you offer them the information necessary for them to develop further. Well, that's, that's very true. And um, what they might find of interest are something that, that relates to their heritage, um, you know, their, their, their uh, ancestors uh, probably all came from some some other country, country other than this. And um, so many people take that up and, um, and try to uh, find the nostalgia in that. And that may very well happen um, as, uh, as the coming um, uh, item of, of um, central interest uh, for many collectors. Uh, there are... Uh, Gracious, a whole world full of, of coins from most ancient times until modern. Um, we have plenty of things to choose from. Uh, but, but a beginning collector often looks for something where he can make a little money on it. I don't think there's anything wrong with that, but, uh, but it's a difficult thing when you have so many people trying to find uh, those, those rare coins that scarcely exist. Um, you know, I could see um, I can see a wave of interest that might be coming for uh, say Mexican coins. Um, Mexican coins have been overlooked for many, many years. 
there are probably uh, untold rarities hiding in, you know, in, in the assortment of Mexican coins that go back uh, for several hundred years and are still available today at, uh, at reasonable prices. Um, this is, I, I cite only as an example of what, what could be. I'm not promoting that. But uh, new books are out on <laughs> every topic, as you well know. Um, and uh, I think that if we cultivate a new generation of collector interest, um, these people will find something that will appeal to them and keep the hobby alive. I have great confidence in that. I do too, and I appreciate you bringing up Mexican coins. Of course, uh, we recently lost Don Bailey, who uh, is probably one of the most important figures for the popularization of Mexican coins in the United States. I think uh, you're spot on in your remark about world coins and the fact that World coins are so affordable right now that it really doesn't even matter which country you'd like to collect. They're attractive opportunities in Asian coins, European coins, African coins. Uh, Central American coins recently received tremendous enthusiasm when Stax Bowers offered them for sale at the NYINC. I, I think that there's an, there's an excellent book uh, that came out uh, this year on Central American coins by Brian Stickney, which uh, the ANS put out. Uh, and I think if you like world coins, this uh, should be in your library. Absolutely, 100%. I also want to say that there's an amazing amount of information that's available now, I think, to collectors because of the Internet has laid a foundation for the sharing of information uh, from collectors and researchers. And so people coming into the hobby today uh, will have the ability to develop a level of sophistication and understanding about numismatics that would have been inconceivable even 20 or 30 years ago, you know, when Breen published his big encyclopedia of Doubleday, you know, at that time it was considered a magnum opus for the hobby. But if you consider how much more has been written and how much more is available now at the, you know, the click of a mouse, it dwarfs all that had come before. And so now we're, we're quite fortunate to experience this hobby at the present time when, you know, so much information is available to us. Um, Absolutely right. And, and available quite easily on the Internet. Um, things that, you know, we couldn't even imagine uh, being available in the past. Uh, I, I always maintain a very large library at home uh, and uh, on all topics from most ancient to the modern. And uh, now, you know, I can, I can find half of that information right on the, right on the Internet at my fingertips today. Uh, with something unheard of, of course, in the past. So um, we certainly have made the hobby uh, available and should be attractive to to many people. We just have to get their attention and bring them into the fold. Let's talk really quickly, uh, if you want. I know this is uh, switching gears. Uh, I participated a few years ago as a Red Book contributor, um, but you obviously dealt with this topic of the marketplace and price levels over the course of your career. There's a psychology that goes into coin values, and uh, the optimistic belief that coins will turn a profit for buyers has been probably part and parcel of coin collecting for as long as uh, there have been price guides. Uh, and obviously, when you look at you know pre-World War II period, it's probably fairly easy to see major rarity go up in value by double or triple every time it sells because, you know, you're starting at a low price and, and working your way up as more people uh, come into the hobby and the uh, perception of value is there and people have this uh, desire to collect important and rare objects. I think it's much harder to appreciate similar levels of growth once uh, coins reach mature prices, especially coins that, you know, reach into the millions of dollars in price. Uh, you have far fewer people who can afford coins at this uh, level, and uh, the returns of double or triple the investment just aren't there uh, for most of these coins. You know, we saw as much uh, recently with the 1913 nickel, you know, the, the finest one known, one of three that could be held in private collections, sold for about what it sold for a decade before. And you see this all the time with coins, uh, where some might dramatically go up in price while others remain constant. And yet still others appear to lose value over time, especially if uh, one takes into account inflation. I feel like when I read numismatic books that talk about the investment market, they all operate under the assumption that coins are going to go up in value because it's always been this way. Over your career working on the Red Book, I mean, did you share this opinion or this outlook 
uh, when you were putting the price guide together, or did you see the potential for a market correction as a number of people entering the hobby, you know, tailed off and prices for most classic coins got really high? Uh, realistically, we learned very, very, very early that um, prices fluctuate. They go up and they go down. They go in cycles. And um, uh, that's always been the case, and I think it will continue to be the case. Now, Walter Breen tried to predict those cycles in, um, in some of his early writings, um, but they were guesses, just as anybody has guesses. We've been on a, um, a rather long period uh, where prices have kind of been on an upward trend. And um, sometimes very, very high and volatile in upward trends. But um, I don't expect that's going to continue. In fact, we've seen softening in various parts of the market, and uh, and that will continue. And I just think that the market will continue to cycle ups, have its ups and downs, um, which vary with. Um, with each particular series of coins, you know, gold might go up while copper goes down or vice versa. Um, so these trends can, are unpredictable. They have to just depend upon uh, whatever influences the, the collector interest. And I think it will always be that way. In my experience, it's always been that way and will probably always continue to be that way. The the upward trend that we've seen over the past 10 years, um, in my estimation, just could not continue, and it has not. There, there's softening that we see in various portions of the hobby already. How did you, as the uh, editor of Prices in the Red Book, avoid undue influence of people trying to get an advantage by getting the Red Book to uh, raise prices on coins that they might have an interest in selling? I, I remember uh, an instance where Anthony Swiatek and Walter Breen uh, wrote an encyclopedia of classic commemorative coins, and inserted in those pages was a chapter promoting Booker T. Washington half dollars and other not so desirable commemorative coins that the publisher of the book, uh, Stanley Applebaum, had for sale in volume. So I assume for marketers, the Red Book would be a major target for those trying to uh, manipulate the market levels of certain coins. Well, um, because we carefully picked the piece, the um, contributors. And um, and we pretty much knew who was who was doing what, who was promoting what, who happened to have a bunch of uh, you know a certain a certain kind of coins, and uh, we could see who was promoting promoting those. Um, uh, we we just very carefully analyzed the market, and we'd toss out those prices if we uh, if we uh, suspected something. And um, and then we would average the prices that uh, that the contributors sent to us. So we'd find a pattern very easily, very quickly, and uh, say, "Oh yeah, now now we see where this price trend is going," and um, and could find a a decent average. And and it's it worked. We had a system that that seemed to work. You've had a long and varied career and have been involved in uh, so many uh, things uh, relating to the hobby. What was your favorite adventure with coins? Well, uh, we'll go a little bit off subject, but um, to answer that question, I guess probably my favorite, most memorable experience was uh, a diving with Mel Fisher uh, when he discovered the Atocha treasure. Um, at that time, I was um, um, in uh, working for the ANA in their authentication bureau, and um, I was invited to go and dive uh, to authenticate the coins that they were bringing up from the bottom of the ocean. And uh, <laughs> so I learned to scuba and uh, got certified and. Um, I just had the experience in my life of, of diving and seeing that treasure at the bottom of the ocean. Uh, so that that was probably my uh, 
most thrilling numismatic experience. I mean, did those coins look unreal to you, just lying there? Something, you know, so valuable spread about the bottom of the ocean? Uh, yeah. <laughs> it, was, uh, it was just incredible. There was the chest after chest of these, uh, these coins and scattered around the bottom and, and bars and all, of, all sorts of things. Um, and, you know, and um, for other numismatic experiences, um, of course, I enjoyed working with the government on uh, the assay commission and uh, and being on the citizens advisory commission uh, uh, committee to uh, uh, you know uh, establish the designs of coins. So I've, I've had just a lot of good experiences and. Working with the Washington people, I got to meet uh, a lot of uh, the people who were responsible for our coinage, and um, just got to learn a lot about Washington politics, um, which I didn't always find pleasant, but uh, certainly it was a great experience. I love talking to people who sit on the CCAC and also uh, mint engravers. Uh, this part of the process for me is so interesting. You know, there's no shortage of criticism of new coin issues. I think if you go back and read any coin publication uh, put out over the course of the past century, you'll see uh, this is the fact. There's no shortage of criticism. Uh, if you read the old issues of the numismatists uh, throughout the years, you'll see harsh words written about the peace dollar, the Jefferson nickel, uh, the Washington quarter. It goes on and on. And I think this is especially true over the course of the past 30 years. Uh, with the modern commemorative series, there there really have been no iconic designs to come out of the modern program, with the exception of maybe a few pieces like maybe the discus thrower and the Olympics dollar or Elizabeth Jones Liberty five dollar gold coin, some others. But when you are sitting on a committee that, that's in charge of recommending great coin design and not getting it. Were you ever frustrated that we we're just going to be unable to recapture that lost sense of beauty and allegory that existed on our early 20th century coins? Right, exactly so, yes. Um, yes, without being specific, yes, there were many designs that, uh, that the committee would have rejected, but um, we were often overruled. And uh, I think that happens even more so today. Um, there's something about the uh, the rush to create so many different designs today uh, is giving us some very poor artwork. And uh, if I, I guess I can be critical. Other people are being critical of these designs, and uh, I, I find the artistry to be very poor and very uh, ill-conceived. Well, we do not shy away from giving our opinions. Uh, I think on, on Coin Week, we commented on the American Innovation dollar coin design uh, proposals that the CCAC rejected by a vote of 10 to 0. Uh, I wrote that if the men had produced it, it would have been the worst coin design in the history of the U.S. Mint. And it's, and it's, it's strange to me because, it, because in many respects, we're in a golden age of numismatics because... The amount of money and research that is being put into coin development is unprecedented in the history of the industry. And yet, our mint doesn't quite get that you can create beautiful and innovative coins that redefine what people think and feel when they think of a coin. And I find it frustrating when I go to the World's Money Fair in Berlin and see all of this innovation and know that these products are succeeding in their marketplaces. And then I come back home and I see the continued tokenization of our circulating coins and commemorative coin programs that seem repetitive, dull, and boring. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, and I only see that getting worse instead of better. Um, and I don't refer just to our United States Mint, but all over the world. As we get closer and closer to a cashless society, uh, mints are going out of business. And uh, so they're trying desperately, I think, to um, uh, to create some kind of new markets for for their process, for their uh, uh, ability to, to to produce coins and stay in business and keep their jobs. And so, um, 
so we had this proliferation of well what i call what I call pseudo coins um, you know they they're non circulating in many cases or they're just bullion or whatever they are they're they're uh, i think disrupting normal collecting because they sell these to people on the premise that uh, these are rare and wonderful items. And then when the poor collector goes to sell them, they find that, uh, gee, they really aren't rare and wonderful and worth a lot of money. And, of course, they blame the coin dealers at that point for uh, trying to cheat them. So they're not having a good effect on our hobby, and I, I remain critical of that. So then are you saying you think it would be better for the mints if they just produce the coins that they are statutorily required to produce and then just face an uncertain future based on the shifting nature of our spending habits? Because if we're not for the mints' attempts to stay relevant by making these modern collectibles, then the future would be very bleak for coins. Uh, because as coins become more and more irrelevant and valueless, the potential for nostalgia to be drawn from them gets diminished as well. Right. Uh they could go back to producing beautiful art metals, as they did in the past, as as many mints have done, as the Paris Mint does. Um, they could do that, take their time and produce some good art metals, call them metals, call them what they are, and uh, sell them at reasonable prices. I think that would be uh, uh, an alternate uh, solution. I. I don't think mints will totally, I don't think coins will totally go out of circulation for many, many years, but uh, I do see it coming. Do you think that it's been a negative impact on the hobby in America where, you know, we've adopted these effigies of presidents on coins in the first half of the 20th century and, and it's become non-politically correct to uh, advocate for the removal of the effigies of Washington, Jefferson, and Lincoln from coins? Uh, so that we can change the designs like every generation or so as we used to throughout the uh, history of the country when liberty was the central motif. You know, and I ask this because I think we can look at the controversy surrounding the potential removal of Andrew Jackson from the 20. You know, my sources inside the BEP tell me that the Trump administration has stopped development on the Tubman note altogether and has delayed the release of the new 20 series until 2026. And this uh, coincides uh, when you know, Trump's administration wouldn't be in power. Uh, could be sooner, but definitely by 2026. Uh, leaving it up to uh, whoever comes next to deal with the ramifications of removing a president from an American currency note. And so now what we have is what I would call an imperial coinage. And because of this, we're faced with stagnant designs and a lack of real artistic progress. And the lowering of relief and the cheapening of our coins has only made the original artistic vision of the coins designers suffer. Well, uh, I don't know what the uh, solution to that is. Um, certainly, uh, the history of our currency from 1862 on, um, there were just many, many, many beautiful designs and um, uh, quite a variety of designs. Uh, they've done that successfully, I think, with paper money, although then, then came the time when the, the theory was don't make any changes because uh, that will aid uh, counterfeiting. I, I think uh, we've kind of changed our views on that. And I don't know what the solution is or the answer is. Uh, but we do have to look to the future when, uh, when we go to a cashless society. We only have to point back to 1857 when the large cent and the half cent uh, went away and were replaced by small cents. And there you have the beginning of the coin hobby in America as we know it today. The Lincoln cent was introduced more than 100 years ago and could have been deprecated years ago. And I doubt anybody would notice a dramatic change in their lives. But doing this would create a collector market for cents that doesn't exist today. As people would scramble to build a collection of the last American one cent coin. And I imagine the same thing could be said about paper money if the $1 bill or the $5 bill were eliminated in favor of a new coin series. Or even if these notes just were reimagined. If the Treasury came out and said starting in 2020 the currency will feature new state-of-the-art features and designs honoring 
a century of American innovators, explorers, and statesmen. Change is great for the collector market, but we don't get change. We get more of the same. Absolutely. Um, yes, absolutely. That um, the whole coinage system that we have today needs to be re revamped, redesigned, and uh, and and changed. You know, eliminating the cent and nickel and adding new denominations and uh, and making them. Uh, have ascending sizes for ascending values. You know things that all other nations have done, and we've just lagged way behind in modernizing our coins. It's something that needs to be done, and that alone would prop up uh, collecting interest. But uh, we, uh, but but any of those suggestions have always fallen on deaf ears in Washington. I agree. I think part of it, from what I understand in talking to the Mints, is brought about due to the strength of the paper money lobby. In stable countries, you seldom see low denomination issues of paper money become obsolete and uh, get replaced by coins. It's uh, usually coins are the things that become obsolete and discontinued. Yeah. It should, it should be a, probably a $2 coin and a $5 coin. Well, the odds of that happening, given the way our government operates now, is somewhere between none and zero. I think. Um, but uh, thank you, Ken, so much uh, for taking the time to talk with us. I know I learned quite a bit. And as someone whose career and whose interest in coins was magnified and nurtured by the work that you put in over the years, I want to thank you oh so much. Well, thank you, Charles. It's uh, always a pleasure to chat with you, and uh, we'll do it again sometime. Okay. Take care. If you like this podcast, please share it with your friends. Remember, you can download all 106 episodes of the Coin Week podcast for free from the iTunes store or stream them online on coinweek.com. I'm editor Charles Morgan. Until next time, happy collecting.